What's up everyone, Mike here from The Art of Guitar, here with a Weezer Artist Series. I'm super excited about this one. Uh, there's a lot of dimensions to Weezer's guitar playing uh, when it comes to Rivers or Brian playing. Uh, they switch off a lot, so sometimes it's hard to know who plays what, but uh, a lot of it comes from the twisted mind of Rivers. And uh, we're gonna explore that today, and I want you to uh, keep an open mind and see how these techniques can help you, not just with guitar, but also we have some songwriting techniques thrown in there and a few other things, so check it out. Okay, so for anybody who doesn't think Weezer stuff is difficult on guitar, uh, try this first thing. It's a really fast arpeggiated chord progression, and it starts off the Blue Album. And I used to think it was finger picked, but if you watch them live, Brian's actually alternate picking everything. So slow, it would look like this. <laughs> Okay, the reason I say to alternate pick it, first of all, it's because he does, but also if you try to do like double upstrokes, any kind of economy picking, it's really hard to do at this high speed. So really go for the alternate picking and you should be able to pull this off. Okay, it was the 90s and a ton of bands would follow this uh, T-shape, I call it. I have a video I'll call the L-shape and the T-shape for chord progressions. And uh, if you take a power chord and just move it in this T-shape, you've got a lot of great songs. So that would be the T-shape. See how it makes a T like that? There's also the L-shape. You've probably heard this a lot. So you see how it's shaped like an L? But Weezer makes good use of this from My Name is Jonas with the T chord. You can hear it in tons of different songs. If you go through the Weezer tab book, you'll find almost every other page has a split octave, or spread octave, I should call it. And that's where you're doing the octaves, two octaves, but you're not doing these typical octave shapes like you like to do on the lower strings. Those are completely valid. What Rivers does a lot is the spread octave where you're on the higher strings. So now you're gonna be on, let's say, the third string and the first string. And we're gonna actually have to add an extra fret between our fingers. So you end up with this shape. The hard part is muting that middle string so just the two octaves happen. <laughs> You can also do that on the fourth and second strings. And he uses it real effectively in usually either a lead part or adding a second guitar part. You'll probably notice that a lot of things we do today relate to the second guitar part going over the main part. Because usually the main guitar player is doing power chords, and so it leaves a lot of room for that second guitarist to fill things in. Towards the uh, end of the solo part, there's a cool climb that goes on. And that's where you're gonna play three chords, but you're gonna climb in triads. And it's really good to know your theory for this. That way this won't seem like as big of a mystery. But if you just go like this, this is outlining a C chord. Okay, it's actually part of this. Try to visualize it like that better. But then they go to an A minor chord. So what they do is they just bring this G note up to A and they form this shape. And that's gonna be an A minor triad right there. And then it's a G triad, so we move up to this shape. So like I said, if you know your triads, this all makes sense. If not, uh, just follow along for now and catch up later. We teach all this on the website, by the way. So there's the theory aspect to all this stuff. Now, he, he, they do the same thing again. So from C to A minor to G, but they go up to uh, other voicings. So now we're going to go C here. That, look, that might look like a familiar shape to you. The A minor, you just add the pinky here. Then the G, we just line it up. It comes from that. Every one of these triads comes from a bigger shape that you're used to. Now, the picking of it can be kind of difficult, kind of like the intro to the song. Using a pick and alternate picking is probably the best bet. Uh, in the studio, I don't know, I might have used my fingers. That's a little more efficient, but playing like this sounds better, in my opinion. That sticks out a little bit more. So here's, here's what we're going to do. Now 
Not as easy as it might seem. One of my favorite songs by them is called No One Else, and I uh, love the lyrics to that tune. But I noticed the chord sounded very interesting, and if you break it down, it's sort of like a counterpoint melody rhythm. So what's going on is you're going to have a higher note and then a lower note that moves around almost like a bass line. <laughs> So it's sort of interesting to break down. Let's just go through each part. We start off with the E power chord. Though we quickly move the bass note down half a step. End up with an octave at C sharp. And then things get really interesting. Check this out. That's an interesting sound you don't hear every day. Then we move this down, the bass note down to A, and we play with the top notes. Eventually ending up on E. Rivers has a very musical mind, so I'm sure playing just typical power chords gets a little boring after a while for him. So just moving things around is a very interesting way to change it up a little bit. So same thing happens during the verse. It's not just typical power chords moving around. If you listen to the bottom note, it's moving before the chord moves sometimes. So it's almost like a walking bass line underneath it all. A lot more interesting than just moving power chords around, like I was saying. So what they're doing here is they're taking a pretty cool chord progression, but they're picking it in a very, um, I guess you'd call it syncopated way. And it's sort of herky-jerky sounding, but it's very musical, and it's a great way to start the song off. So real slow, here's what we have. So played one at a time, the chords would sound like this. Be a little more boring if he just went. It's not bad because the chords are so cool anyway, but just breaking up the picking really makes it unique. Okay, we made it to Buddy Holly. I love this song. First time I saw the video, you know, it was the Happy Days thing. Very cool. Uh, this song has a lot to offer. And the first thing is what we talked about earlier, where the second guitar gets to do a little bit of addressing by adding a second part. So this is a really interesting thing if you break it down. The chords that are going on are as follows. D major. C sharp minor. F sharp minor. So Brian goes like this live. He'll take two of the notes in the triad and just play them back and forth. So here we have the top of a D chord. Once again, uh, knowing your theory will help a lot in this case. And always keep in mind whenever I do these artist series, I'm not here to teach you those in-depth things like the theory of behind things usually, uh, just to show you the techniques. So jump to the website for all that other stuff. Okay, then this is going to be the C-sharp minor. If you extend it, extend it even more. So it all comes from something much bigger. And the last part. That's your F sharp minor. That might be a little cryptic unless I, until I go like this. That's going to be your F sharp minor chord right there. So he's just playing the two notes from it here. Put it all together, it's actually a really cool second guitar part. Especially when it goes from D major to D minor. Just switch like that. You know, it's easy to rack your brain when you're trying to write, write a solo, not being able to do anything that you think sounds good. Sometimes it's just easy enough to follow the vocals. And it's not a bad thing just because it's easy. But uh, follow the vocals. The vocalists hopefully wrote a great melody if it was Rivers, definitely. And uh, it's, it's kind of cool how the guitar just doing the vocal melody can make for a really good solo or just a part to fill in between parts. <laughs> Okay, if you grew up listening to Nirvana, you probably know the next trick here. It goes like this. Uh, 
Okay, so that's a lot like the Smells Like Teen Spirit thing, where you just touch the strings a little bit, and you don't really calculate it. You know, it's not like a, I'm gonna do a fifth fret, fourth fret type thing. It's nothing like that for these natural harmonics. It's just be in this area and hit the strings really hard. You're gonna get something different every time, most likely, but it sounds cool and very aggressive. It's a good way to spice up this bridge part. The thing is, is you can't be shy about it. If you pick kind of like in a subtle way, sometimes the harmonics don't come out the way you want them. So really just go after those strings. All right, most likely you're not gonna break them. If you want some really weird sounding chords, sometimes instead of doing a pedal tone on the bottom, which is where you just play a bass note through the entire thing, like in the Dream Theater uh, video that we just did, there was a lot of chords that you would do over the top of like a low string ringing out, like this. So no matter what we do, the low string rings out. Well, in Weezer's case, we're going to flip that around. It's kind of weird to go from a Dream Theater to a Weezer artist series. So I still have John Petrucci in my head. But if you make a chord shape and you just let the top note ring out, no matter what you're doing at the bottom, you get some really interesting results. So here's what they do. Okay, you get a little bit of that string dissonance or that chord dissonance going on. So I changed the bass note, but I kept the top note, the B string. Then I move this up. And back. So what ties all those together? Just that open B string. Well, B flat. We're two and a half step down, by the way. Uh, if you play Weezer, you have to do that. All right, so put that together, and you're going to hear how that open string causes some crazy dissonance. resolve. Very musical guitar players usually do this in the studio, I notice. Uh, after the solo's done and the vo vo uh, vocals come back in, sometimes they get an idea and they want to keep it going. And it's overlapping with the vocals in a really cool way. And at the end of the Sweater Song solo, that happens. It's something like this. So he waits a little while, it's actually a measure and a half, and then he throws a lick in there, and then the solo's finished. So overlapping the solo into the next part, in this case the chorus, is a very musical way to tie the parts together, instead of always thinking that a solo has to end and then the next part comes in. The end of this song is so chaotic. Um, what I'm noticing from the tab book is tons of bends, but I was surprised to see that one of the bends goes up, up to like three steps. I don't think I'm going to try to do this to this guitar today. I need to use it for a gig coming up. But I'm going to go to the third string, 19th fret, and I'm going to start with a whole step bend, second, uh, I'm sorry, a double bend, two step bend, two and a half, and then maybe three. Let's see. Ooh, three steps. I thought this would be the first time I broke a string live on camera, but uh, didn't happen. When he does the beginning of Say It Ain't So, you really feel this kind of interesting muted rhythm happen. And if you didn't have it, it would be half the riff that it is. So if you go like this. Isn't that pretty funky? You got this whole. It's almost like that. If I sped it up, it would almost sound like a disco funk tune, which is kind of funny. Maybe I'll do a remix. You see some of these upstroke hits that I'm doing, and there's some mutes going on too. I've seen some people play this riff kind of with less of that funkiness, and it sounds kind of lame. It's like... It doesn't have that real excitement to it. So you really have to work on those funk strums like I teach on a lot of the videos. If you put this stuff, I always go back to Voodoo Child, the Hendrix thing going on, with the chords. Just takes on a different life. Now I tend to overdo it because I really love that funk strumming. I'd probably dial it back a little bit if I was playing this on stage, maybe like. Oh, 
Oh, and once again, Rivers is doing that open string dissonance. Kind of like in the sweater song. So that lesson, that technique comes back in the song. And it's really effective because without it, it doesn't have that sort of um, darkness to it. There's a little bit of like a melancholy feeling when you hear this. Versus if he went. See, it's still cool. It just sounds a little too happy from what you're used to. I call these ska upstrokes only because a lot of ska is really like... That's real fast and upbeat. But if you slow that way down, you have the verse for Say It Ain't So. And it's still the same chords uh, as the main part of the song, but you just do upstrokes. And you try primarily to hit the high three strings. Okay, when you do that, make sure you're going one and two and three and four and some people do downstrokes, which is fine too. For me personally, it's just harder to kind of feel it. If you're going like this, one. See, it just doesn't have the same feel as when you do an upstroke and hit them like this. Maybe it's from playing some ska back in the day. comes back to the, it always comes back to the mighty boss tones. Okay, we all know this part. When the chorus breaks in, especially towards the end, I believe, is when he starts doing this, there's a unison bend. There's always a unison bend in almost every artist series. Rivers uses it all the time, very effective. Once again, it creates a very chaotic sound. That's where you bend a note, and then the higher note that you play at the same time is the same note that you're bending to, so it creates this great sound. In this song, he jumps back and forth. Live, I actually saw him do it in the studio. I'm sure it's just an overdub, but. Something like that. It's kind of difficult to jump back and forth. In the tab book, it said to go like this. Just didn't really sound or feel right to me. And then I saw a video of him actually doing this. So uh, either way, you could do that. This is a half step unison bend using open an open string which sounds cool too, but I think you could really dig in if you do this one. So I, I prefer that one. Okay, you don't get out of finger picking. Uh, in this particular intro, there's kind of a difficult finger picking passage and it just moves really fast. You have to be able to jump from chord to chord and they do this first form chord, which is a little difficult to jump to. Not a lot of guitar players are used to jumping to this shape. So real slow, we're gonna be outlining a lot of chords here, but really pay attention to my right hand. You wanna do the correct um, finger picking fingers for this. So you've got your thumb covering the, the fat strings. This is just a general rule. And then index, middle, ring, covering the next, okay? So slow, you get this. Then you jump to this shape. A minor. E minor, back to the G, strange shape for the D, and a walk down from C, and it throws in another note there. So put that together and you get this. Now we got the good old Weezer chord, taught this on a lot of other artist series, but it's finally Weezer. And it's where you take a power chord and you just bar the fifth, so it's gonna be just the same fret as the first finger, just on the lower string. And you get what I call the Weezer chord, it's just a fatter sounding version of the previous chord. So if you have a C power chord, and you add that lower fifth below it, you get this big huge sound underneath it. Versus going like this, which still sounds great, but now it just has that extra, almost like a seven string oomph to it. All right, Rivers does this once on the Pinkerton album, but it's so cool I wanted to show it to you. It's just a quick little thing you could do to make some crazy sounds. So he's going crazy up here, bending the 22nd fret, and then out of nowhere he goes like this. That sounds like a Tom Morello trick. So 
So if you've heard the song Tired of Sex, the first song on that album, uh, check out the solo. He just totally shreds on that one. Okay, this is probably my favorite Weezer song. And it, what I like about it in the beginning is they're using full chords. They're not just doing power chords like a lot of people do. You hear the fullness of the chord, so they're doing a bar chord. And you get this instead. When I play it live, I actually do up and down strokes. Though. You get a little bit more of that percussive sound that I really like. Versus. Here's a cool songwriting trick. During the chorus, when they're playing C major, D, G, E, uh, the first time around they play C major as the one chord. The second and beyond, they go to A minor. So they just actually do an A power chord. But what it ends up sounding like is it starts off kind of positive and then all of a sudden it gets kind of dramatic and sad. So here's what we have. So it's a little bit of a cool songwriter trick to go from that major to the relative minor. Once again, we're getting a little bit into theory here, but since they're so closely related, I always think of it as one is the happy twin and the other is kind of the sad. To go from the happy to the sad really changes the sound a little bit. And Rivers does that all the time. He throws in a little bit of sadness to everything. And uh, that's kind of like in Say It Ain't So with that open string. Suddenly it changes the vibe completely. And in this song, if you don't do that, it just sounds not sad enough. <laughs> See, it just sounds wrong if you don't go here. All right, there's a big surprise in Pinkerton. All of a sudden, there's a slide going on, and it's at the very end of the Good Life solo, and it really just push it, pushes it to the next level, in my opinion, because, first of all, it kind of takes you by surprise that there's slide in a Weezer song. But it's a difficult slide piece for me, especially because there's no vibrato going on, barely. It's very just straight notes until the very end where he gives it a little bit, but just really trying to nail those notes could be difficult as a slide player. Just trying to like use vibrato to cover some of your mistakes is a common thing. Kind of like when you sing and you really don't hit a note so you add vibrato. Well, the same thing goes with the slide. If you could just get away with going like this, you know, it covers a lot of pitch, pitch ground right there. So you're kind of safe. But if you just have to get to the note and nail it without frets because you're using a slide, it can be very difficult. So right, even right off the bat, just hitting this first note. Pretty difficult. One thing that I do to practice this is I'll put on a tuner on the guitar and then I'll watch that as I slide just to see if I'm a little bit sharp or flat. You could use your ear of course, that's the best thing to do, but just to make sure at first. Then get rid of the tuner and go from there. Okay, so for Pink Triangle, the intro has this really cool picking part. And if you use finger picking, it's a lot like if you try to play Blackbird, where you're going like this. So there's a note in the middle that you keep hitting. Well, for this intro, it's the same kind of concept. It's not the same note being played every time, but you're still going to that middle note each time to sort of keep you grounded. So you get this outside, inside, outside, inside sort of feel. And if you just take it all the way up the chords, you get this. Those are all the diatonic chords in G. Fun way to practice it actually, and they sort of do that. They come up, but then they quickly come down. It's cool to finally do an artist series for Weezer. And I appreciate you guys watching, and we'll catch you soon. Thanks. Bye.